it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And thank you very much for participating in this project. I'm gonna start, you know, asking you about how you met Aldo Tambellini. First of all, it's a privilege to be here. I met Aldo actually a few years after I had graduated from NYU, where I had gone to film school. And I have a friend from NYU, uh, a great art artist, theorist, art historian, named Michelle Chu. It was about 2014, 2013, when I was with her that she said, hey, do you not know the work of Aldo Tambellini? Because I have a movie called Disney World that utilizes televisions in a similar way to Aldo's Black TV. And that's when she showed me Black TV for the first time. I was in a really terrible place in my life. And I sat in a room, dark, it was full of just junk. And uh, my art supplies were thrown everywhere. Um, and I was disorganized. And I remember after watching Black TV, it didn't make me happier, obviously, but it showed me more of like a, a militant concern that my work, uh, although I was addressing politics, I had to actually live by those politics and keep working. And so I um, contacted Aldo through Facebook, through Aldo's wife, Anna, um, I was able to, to get on a phone call with him. The first phone call that I had with Aldo, I expressed how I felt about his work, and there was an immediate connection. Like, the way that I viewed his work was the way that he, what he meant to express. Aldo told me some stories about uh, the Gate Theater so at first, what he would do was he, they'd show, my understanding is they would show regular movies in the Gate Theater, but then he would also have his experimental nights. Usually, I believe it was Puerto Rican uh, youth in the, uh, in the neighborhood, he tried to bring them in to teach them how to project. So he was working with the community. He was already trying to, to essentially create like a social engagement and give, give these kids jobs teach them something they could use, then using it to do avant-garde performances, and then when he also interfaced more and more with the black poet um, kind of culture in, in Brooklyn, he brought folks in and created the Black Gate, which was a performance space, multi-media uh, performance space. Uh, later on, he would do shortwave broadcasts, and it was in the Black Gate above that he developed this idea of creating a sort of art centrifuge. It's both participatory and spectacular. The idea was to not to stray from politics, but to find the connection between the politics of civil rights at that time, the, the radical politics, and the radical politics or the radical exploration of space mm -hmm. that could occur all in one space. You were doing a VR project together. How was working with VR with Aldo Tambellini, who works with the analog media? One thing that I think uh, is really necessary in, um, in looking at Aldo and describing who he is as an artist, on one end, Aldo never strays from the word, right? Poetry is the basis, I think, for everything that he does. And so no matter what, you can't strip him of his words. Even as he was older and some of his motor skills are deteriorating, he can always go back to that practice. Um, but that being said, he's an artist who is always bored with the current media, and he always is thinking about what's coming up next and what's coming up next. And so as soon as he has a firm grasp over anything, he seems to switch to the next media. Even with black TV and the films that he made, first he was painting on, on film slides, to then making the movie through a camera, to then learning how to do multiple exposures through the camera, to the point where he ditches the normal analog camera and works with video. And from there, he's, he was started to work into uh, 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 broadcast technology, shortwave broadcasting, 
And from there, he went into MIT, where he was actually kind of a futurist, thinking about email, thinking about uh, the internet, thinking about first video phone, right? <laughs> he's, he's, yeah. he's part of these experiments far ahead of his time. So I actually think with looking at his notes, um, which I've had the pleasure of going through years and years of his handwritten notes, um, Aldo came up with something like uh, what is known as the cave system in VR, but in, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, with multiple projectors in a room, and the black gate was always kind of like an attempt at creating an all-immersive environment fits the description of virtual reality. Um, as virtual reality as we know it now is is that. It's, 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 an, it's an all-immersive environment. It's really defined by one concept, which is presence. When you enter into a virtual reality, do you begin to forget your physical presence in physical reality and then begin to think that your physical state is actually more in common with with the, with the mediated state of existence. And so he was already working on this uh, concept of virtual, virtual reality a long time ago. Aldo's first piece showed a clear understanding that essentially he could create a digital cube where you would be inside of it and he could control and manipulate the space of the cube. Now they did that using all archival material and with no camera, and they took it into uh, After Effects, uh, and Aldo worked with Dan to create a concept piece. Now, Bleak is an artist uh, from South Korea who works with a, a computer uh, animation company, and they saw Aldo's work separately and said, wow, this needs to be virtual reality. So they contacted Aldo, and they made a computer-generated virtual reality piece, uh, which I don't believe is released just yet. It's different because it's not, um, it, there's not an analog element to it. It's a totally digital, totally computer generated piece. But when you think about all those uh, work with the void, especially the work with black holes, um, it's an experience of just being thrown out into the abyss. Um, but when we talk about the abyss, right, in, in relation to Aldo Tambellini, that's that's like approaching the infinite. That's this is a positive. This is a beautiful concept in his work. For Aldo, God, the universe is is black, and therefore blackness is the fabric of our existence. Is the fabric of our humanity. Um, and moreover, in Black Plus X, he utilizes negative to also comment on the fact that. Our vision is flipping imagery. We don't even know what anything looks like. It's just filtered through our head. And so Aldo has this um, immediate understanding of civil rights, having been born and lived into a situation in World War II where he saw the absence of it. He saw the absence of humanity. And then he finds the positive opposite to go into. That's the way uh, I think an artist can actually be activist, if you live with that as a motivation. Black is in the subject, in images, in languages, in the meanings. Why black? And also, do you think that this black obsession has some relation with the audio's life i mean because aldo lived in a very uh, uh hard hard days in, in italy uh mm -hmm. in in the fascism and uh, and his city was uh bombed you know in, in in the second world war i would say that the blackness actually originates from that or his awareness of it originates it from that so aldo was born in syracuse new york but when he was really young he was uh, taken uh, to Italy with his mother and he went to Lucca where he attended art school as a child but this is at the time that Mussolini was in power his brother was a little bit older and so his brother Paul uh, was sent to re-education camp 
uh, which everybody had to. They, they essentially went um, and were given propaganda every day. Um, and Aldo already started being a bit of a radical by, by trying to ditch um, and trying to avoid going to these, um, uh, essentially, the propaganda. Um, but then by the end of the, the war, or in Italy, um, his town was bombed. It was actually bombed by the Americans, um, but it was in order to liberate them. And so the Buffalo soldiers, who are uh, African-American soldiers, they liberated his town. And that is, I think, where you get two associations with all those work. One is that he associated blackness at that point with her heroism. He associated blackness with a guardian, somebody who was um, essentially shielding him. And what was the whiteness, but really the blinding light of bombs going off? And I didn't really get that because at first, until I started to look at some of all those paintings, um, all those paintings, there's one in particular that's all white except for a scratched off piece, like a white paper. It's not even a canvas. It looks like he just took trash, actually, and he started to paint on it and then scraped it off. And the more you look at it, the more you look at it, what you begin to see is they're the dead bodies of children and a dog, potentially, or a horse. And mm. the whiteness is what surrounds. So I get the, the sense that he, for him, these wrong moral connotations that we have to blackness and whiteness, um, the, the societal connotations, they were flipped because he had this episode of trauma and in it, he saw everything blasted, right? I also just think about too, the amount of potentially marble or, or uh, other like debris that was kicked up. Um, and, and to me, that, that, that already creates like an, an image in my head when I think about him, when he's, when he's told the story, um, of being blinded in, in a sort of like a cloud of whiteness, actually. And then to associate essentially the heroism of the black soldiers who are fighting for, for a country that didn't even think of them as, as human beings, let alone citizens, right? So Aldo moved back to Syracuse, New York, after that and it was then that he saw how disgusting the united states was um and that's where his activism started because he's thinking these people came and saved my life and you people won't even treat them like like uh regular people like, like human beings but not only that back then italians weren't treated like human beings either so he came in also experiencing you know obviously with white privilege, but experiencing a uh, second uh, class. And, and, and instead of, which happens a lot, uh, I'm Latino, you know, and it happens a lot with minority communities, we've been pit against each other and we fight against each other. So rather than actually uh, fall for that, right, the rope of dope that, that the, they, were, they were basically trying to get us to fight each other, he, he decided that he was gonna make it his lifelong uh, goal to essentially fight for civil rights. So I think uh, what Aldo won, what Aldo will always say, beyond the blackness of the universe, right, is that without the basic r civil rights, without the understanding of the love that we have for all people, right, you can't arrive at a greater concept of blackness. So it, it, it comes from a political reality. It comes from physical reality first. Then he sees the sky and the enveloping, uh, or the idea of the, the black hole as being um, the fabric of our, of our being. Would we say that he was trying to catch the blind spot of America? Oh yeah. He was immediately aware of white privilege. He, when he did use his white privilege, it was always for the benefit uh, of others. I think that he also saw the white privilege that was inherent in the art community in New York at the time as well. 
And so him recognizing the blind spot was also recognizing that, one, black folks needed depictions that weren't just the Hollywood depiction. That's what Black Plus X is. I mean, yeah. Black Plus X is not a negative movie, even though it's shot partially with negatives. negatives yeah. Black Plus X is exuberant. It's showing, showing black children enjoying themselves in Coney Island and actually having a moment of fun on a rocket ship ride. Yes. And then that takes us out into the universe yeah. again. So there's this, this, this binary that's constantly at work with, with his pieces that also does not reduce either concept, and that's the, that's the key. You know, we don't want to reduce blackness to something so easy that we could just depict it and that's it. He's not simulating anything. He's trying to express as best as he can from a position of white privilege. And m moreover, he uses that, then the whiteness is what's breaking up the uniformity and the peace and the calm of blackness often in his work. So there, there is a way in which the whiteness attempts to, to leak in and is sort of uh, assert a, a sense of dominance within the space. And so his negative space is his positive space. He's just flipped in his head, uh, which I, I mean, I, I say flipped in his head, but like the, the truth of the matter is it's right. That's correct. It's also when, when he came to, I won't speak too much about the, the situation with the art community, only to say that he made sure that the work that was being shown was by black poets and black artists, and that he gave opportunities to black children and Puerto Rican children. Um, and he tried to stop some of the ubiquitous, um, or I'd say the folks who were dominating the art scene, who you would know uh, in the 1960s. So anybody uh, surrounding uh, the 1960s experimental film scene knows that there were especially two white male no, artists yes, yes. who were dominating that time mm -hmm. and he refused to capitulate to them and that's part of the reason why he suffered too. There is a, a very uh, strong connection between the, your political views and at the same time the, the politics of the arts. I know that you have an affection for the piece, The Screw, yeah? Yes. The Screw is a performance art piece with sculpture that Aldo devised um, as essentially like a means of critiquing the institution while creating activist art at the same time. So there's, there's, a, there's a theorist named Claire Bishop. Yeah. Uh, who's a, a professor in New York. Yeah. Um, amazing theorist. And she talks about participatory art. Yes. Um, but now participatory art is essentially a way that we can simulate actually doing something for other people. But really, it's just a document of, oh, look at us basically doing something that we're saying that this art piece, that it, its aesthetics are not necessarily grounded but this art piece is, is doing something small for society, right? But in, in essence, sometimes when we create participatory art that way, we negate the purpose of it. We don't really do anything much more than, than give an institution a, re, a reason to say, oh, we did something sure. charitable. Yeah, sure. So Aldo Tambellini did the exact opposite. Yeah. What he did was he actually worked with children in his neighborhood, not because he was creating an art piece, but because he was always doing that. And one day they said, hey, we would like to create a, like a barbershop quartet. And they didn't have enough people to do it. So, but he, he got these kids together. It's my understanding that they were Puerto Rican uh, children from his neighborhood. And um, he taught them a song uh, to sing in harmony, too. And uh, he wrote a speech, and it's called The Screw. And at the same time, the Whitney Museum and the Museum of Modern Art um, were anticipating that he was going to join the collection or he was going to put on a show for them. But rather than do that, he brought over a huge screw that he made out of, uh, like, it was like a, a paper, paper shell. Yeah. 
uh, he brought these children to the performances, and there are pictures where there's huge crowds there, and the newspapers were all there. But what he then did was he gave the screw to the museum, literally giving them the screw, and sang a song and a speech in which he essentially says, art now is just your commodity. You just want this because you want the money. You just want to create spectacle. And he went through like bullet point list and struck down the institutions as he was giving them the screw. And, but of course, they were the ones screwing everybody else. The, the reason why um, I, I bring up the participatory art idea here is that he didn't do this as a, as a participatory art piece that, will, that was actually lacking. He, he burnt bridges, potentially, with what he did. He didn't benefit from it. It took many, many, many years later for him to be able to get back into these institutions. Thank you for, you know, for participating of this. And thank you very much. It's very nice talking to you, always. Uh, yeah, no, I feel the same <laughs> way. Well, hopefully we'll keep talking for years. Yes. Right. And also thank you, everybody.